Father, we humbly approach your throne of grace again, asking for forgiveness of sins, Father, as we try to focus our minds and all of our worship on you. We pray, Father, for the speaker of the hour. We ask, Father, that everything that you have graced him with as far as knowledge and the ability to learn, Father, he brings with him today and he speaks only thus saith the Lord. Let everything that is presented today, Father, be able to prick the sinner and the saint in the heart to either come to Christ or to correct their error. We ask you also, Father, for the sick and shut in and those that are bereaved and those that are depressed and those, Father, that are struggling with whatever ailment or situation in their hearts. Father, we ask that you just strengthen us as your saints, Father, your elect, that we can reach out and be with folks through their hour of need, Father. Be a shoulder for them to lean on and more importantly, Father, be a voice of reasoning to help them, Father, guide them in a way that is positive and comfortable. We also pray for the leadership of this world, Father, those in high places, those that are rulers over men and women. And we ask, Father, that you strengthen the understanding that they have, Father, knowing that they are only in position because of you, Father. We pray that they will product themselves in a way, Father, that will allow your children to move about this world, going and giving the good news of Jesus Christ. And as we close out this prayer, Father, we just ask that we be brave and we be steady in our study, Father, and we also be loving and caring as we carry the word to all of those who do not know your son. And we pray for all these things, Father, in Jesus' name, the Holy Spirit's in yours. Amen. Amen.
and a privilege from the almighty God of heaven above that we have another day on this side of the timeline of life that for whatever reason he chose to do it God has blessed us he has showered us with his love and his grace and his mercy and if you ever want evidence of that fact just consider that for one more day, one more moment, you are among the land of the living and you are being seen and not being viewed. Amen. To those who may be visiting with us this morning, whether in person or in our digital worship space, we extend to you a warm welcome. We're so glad that you've come to visit with us here at the Church of Christ at Northside. And we do consider you our honored guest. And it's our prayer this morning that your visit with us will be strengthening and encouraging and edifying. And that you will want to come back and be with us because you have received benefit by being with us today. We extend to you an open invitation to all of our activities at the Church of Christ at Northside. And wherever you find yourself able and available, 
just come on back and be with us as soon and as often as you can. I'm going to ask this morning that you will turn your Bibles to the fourth chapter of the gospel account as recorded by Mark. Mark, the fourth chapter. And please meet me this morning at verse number 21. Mark, the chapter is four. And beginning at verse 21 and reading through verse 25, Jesus says this. And he said unto them, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed and not to be set on a candlestick? For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And he said unto them, Take heed what ye hear. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that here shall more be given. For he that hath, to him shall be given. And he that hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that which he hath. There was a story about a young boy who was about nine years old. He went with his parents to Europe one summer. And part of that vacation included visits to the great old cathedrals of the past. As they visited cathedral after cathedral, he saw the massive stained glass portraits of the disciples and of other saints. He was very impressed as he stood in those great empty halls looking through the beautiful stained glass windows. And upon returning back home into his home church, he was asked by his Sunday school teacher about the great churches of Europe and what he liked the most. He thought for a moment and he said, I I loved the sense of awesomeness and the hugeness of who God must be. And his teacher asked next, and what is a saint? His mind went back to those massive, beautiful stained glass windows. And his answer to her was, A saint is someone who the light shines through. A saint is someone who the light shines through. And that, my friends, is a very good definition of what a saint of God should be. We have no light of our own. But just like the moon, as we talked about it a few weeks ago, we are to reflect the light of Jesus to a lost and to a dying world. And in our text this morning, Jesus here gives us some insight into what light is and the place it is to occupy in spiritual matters. And I want to show you from these verses, the truth is that we are supposed to be living in the light. Jesus himself said over in John chapter 8 and verse number 12, that he was the light of the world. 
and his light penetrates even the darkest of places, even the blackest of hearts. And his light will give us some insight into things that we ought to be aware of. And I want to share a few facts this morning about light with you as we just simply look at that subject, living in the light. First of all, we see here in verse number 21 that light has its purposes. Look at what he said again. And he said unto them, is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed and not to be set on the candlestick? He teaches his disciples here by using another parable. He uses a common image that would have been familiar to all back in his day. He uses the image of a candle to teach a profound spiritual truth. You see, in that day, Houses did not have electric lights like we are used to. They could not get light in a room by simply flipping a switch. And what they would do is they would have oil lamps typically. Every house had at least one. And it was used to provide light in houses that were naturally dark. And houses back then would have notches cut into the wall so that a lamp could be placed there. You see, when a lamp was lit, it wasn't to be hidden somewhere. They didn't put it under a basket, as Jesus says, or under a bed. It was to be placed in a high location so that everybody in that house could receive light. And the parable that Jesus uses here is designed to illustrate the purpose of spiritual light. You see, when Jesus shared the word of God, he was giving light to the world. And his light was given to people who were trapped in, in spiritual darkness to show them that there was a way for them to be saved and to reconcile with God. Again, when Jesus was here, he proclaimed that he was the light of the world. And his light burned brightly, teaching men about the love of God. His light was designed to reveal the Father to fallen men. And it increased in its intensity until it shone with the glory of heaven as he gave his life for sinners. One thing you can say about the Lord's light. It was never designed to be hidden away and it never was. Let me say that again. His light was never designed to be hidden away, and it never was. He came to this world not to hide the truth from men, but to reveal the truth to all those who were in darkness. And get this, when he saved us from our sins, he placed his light within us. And he does not want us to hide our lights away either. He wants us to allow his light to shine through our lives so that others may see the way to God. But the problem is this. Far too many saints are guilty of hiding the light. Another thing you need to understand about light is light is a tremendous gift. Just want you to reflect back for a moment. Can you remember when the darkness of your sinful past was shattered 
by the light of the gospel. Can you remember when the Lord placed his light within you? And if you can remember, then you know without a doubt the value of that light. And if you understand the value of that light, then you also understand that that light cannot be secreted away, but it must be shared with a lost and a dying world. That's the purpose of light. But then we also see in Jesus' parable that light has its powers. Look at verse number 22. There he says, for there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested. Neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. Jesus here reminds us that light holds the power to make hidden things plain. The light that Jesus came into the world to display not only reveals the hidden things of God to man, but it also reveals the hidden things within man himself. And that's why so many people who have heard the gospel message have rejected it. You see, we always want to tell folk that the gospel is a message of salvation, and it is. But we also have to understand and tell folk that the gospel is a message of confrontation. It's a message that will reveal the darkness of the human heart. But see, and people are just like roaches sometimes. You know how roaches are when the light comes on, the roaches will scatter away. We're just like roaches sometimes. We flee light. When it shines upon us. Why? Jesus said it this way. Because their deeds are evil. You see, when, when, when the light of the gospel shines into a person's heart, it reveals all of the darkness that's contained in that heart. And that's a painful experience. To have all of your junk and your gunk revealed. But also when the darkness is exposed to the light, darkness also has to flee. And when darkness flees and the, 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 the light is received, salvation is the result. The first step in coming to Jesus to be saved is to have your sin exposed to the light. We also have to understand this. There's coming a day in the time when all of the hidden things of darkness will be revealed. You see, Christians will have all of their secrets exposed. Lost people will see their secrets revealed. And there's one thing clear about all of that stuff. Nobody will get away with sin. That's the clear teaching of the scriptures. The hidden works of darkness will always be brought to the light. And it's far better that we drag our sins out into the open. Now, I'm talking about your own sins. I'm not talking about you going and dragging somebody else's now. But it's far better for you to drag your own sins out into the open and confess them to God than to hide them away waiting for God to expose them at the last day. Because you can be assured of one thing, they will be exposed. But when we get honest about our sin, that's when we can expect and experience his forgiveness. But when we try to hide our sins, they will destroy us from within. Light has its purpose and, and light has its power. But Jesus also lets us know that light has its privileges. Verse 24, the Bible says this. He said unto them, 
Take heed what ye hear. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. That one verse right there is just packed with truth. We are in this verse counseled and cautioned to listen to the right voices and to pass the truth on to others. And we're confronted here by a promise if we do that. Let's just look at a couple of things here for a moment. First of all, in in verse 24, Jesus says that we are cautioned to listen to the right voices. Look at what he says again. Take heed what ye hear. Why is that important? Because there are so many voices that are competing for our attention these days. Everywhere you look, somebody has come up with some kind of new idea or or new philosophy, new way of thinking that they want you to buy into. And you got to be careful what you allow to come into your heart. We have to be careful that in spiritual matters that we only hear the Lord's voice as he calls us unto himself. And the right voice, when you listen to people, the right voice will always speak words that line up with the scriptures and point you to Jesus. When we hear that voice, we have to make sure that we heed what it tells us to do. When it calls us to come to Jesus to be saved, we need to come. When it calls us to a life of deeper commitment, we need to obey it. When it calls us to a life of service, we need to surrender and serve. And we need to be aware of how we hear that voice as well. We need to be listening for the voice of the Lord to speak to our hearts. But then he goes on in that same verse and says that we are counseled to pass on the truth to others. Now we've already mentioned this, but it bears mentioning again. The Lord has called us to share the truth that we have received. Say it again. The Lord has called us to share the truth that we have received. Of all the things that you can do with your life, nothing is greater than taking the time to share the things that God has given you to other people. We have been given a great privilege in being called to proclaim the gospel to the world. And it's a privilege that we ought not squander. The problem is too many folk have received the truth and they want to hide it away like it's a gold stash or something. We won't tell nobody nothing. And I don't want to get into the reasons why we don't, but that just goes all the way against the grain of what Jesus says here. He makes it very plain, with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you. That simply means this. The more you give it, the more you're going to get. And that brings us to the third thing about this verse. We're comforted by the Lord's promise. Here's the idea. The more that we listen to what the Lord is telling us and giving us, and the more that we obey him by giving it to others, we will see him reveal even more to us. Here's why a lot of folk 
who have been around the church 30 and 40 and 50 years still act like they're in primary Sunday school. They ain't took the time to give nothing to nobody. So the Lord ain't gave no more to them. If you really want to grow in your walk with God, in your knowledge of God, then share what you already know of God to somebody else who needs it. Did you learn something about the Lord in your private study time? Give it away. Did you glean a nugget in Sunday school last week? Give it away. Did you get something from a sermon that you heard a month ago? Give it away. And as you give away the truth that the Lord has revealed to you, he will give you even more truth. But if you hoard it up and keep it to yourself, God ain't got no reason to give you any more. Understand this about the gospel. It's the only commodity that becomes more valuable to you as you give it away to others. The more you share with others, the more the Lord will share his truth with you. And as you share his truth, as you share your faith, you are making an investment in others and in your own spiritual growth. Jesus put it like this. We're called to be rivers of living water. We're supposed to, in other words, let the truth flow from us. But too many of us act like we're ponds instead of acting like a, a, a flowing river. The truth flows in. You know what a pond is like. A water flows in, but there's no way for that water to get out of it. And if that, that pond sits long enough, uh, that water becomes stagnant and stanky. That's what a lot of us are like. But Jesus calls us to be rivers of living water. Water flows in, water flows out. And as water flows out, more water flows in. And as long as the water is flowing out, more water is coming in. the same, it lines up with what we're to look like. As we share more truth, God reveals more truth to us. We share that truth, God gives us some more. We share that, God keeps on giving as long as we keep on sharing. And I just want you to know, in case there's somebody out there who, who thinks that somehow uh, uh, if I give it away, I'm going to run out. God specializes in giving more. See, see, God doesn't just pardon us. He abundantly pardons us. God just doesn't give mercy. He delighteth in mercy. God doesn't just save. He saves to the uttermost. He doesn't just save the sinner and forgive his sins. Watch what he does. He adopts them uh, into his family. He gives them peace and joy and, and blessing. And he provides security and assurance. Our God majors in giving more. You see, you, you, and, and to understand that, you have to understand this. We have a God who gives not of his riches, but he gives according to his riches. You see, when a billionaire gives a dollar out of his wealth, he is given, but he hadn't given much. He's given of his riches. But when a billionaire gives according to his riches, what he gives can do a whole lot of good. Remember years ago reading an, an article about how Bill Gates, who at the time was the richest man in the world, 
spent hundreds of millions of dollars to have every child in the country, uh, uh, the, uh, an African country, immunized against a deadly disease. That's giving according to his riches. And if you think that's something, what God gives and how God gives makes what Bill Gates did look stupid in comparison. God reaches into his vast stores in heaven and he keeps on giving us more. More love and more mercy and more grace, more forgiveness, more hope, more blessing. We can go on and on with the things God gives. But it's a privilege that comes when we share the light. But then there's one more thing that, that Jesus gives us here about light. And this is in that last verse, verse number 25. He says this, for he that hath, to him shall be given. And he that hath not, from him shall be taken even that which he hath. Jesus here tells us simply that light has its promise. See, what he tells us is this, that the person who hears the truth and passes it on will see his ability to receive truth expanded. And as this person hears the truth and, and as he gives it away, the Lord will continually and constantly reveal more truth to, to that person. And that person will grow in the things of God in ways that you could never imagine. That's the promise he makes to those who give away the light. But he also makes a promise to the person who, who rejects the truth. He says this about that person. That person will see his ability to recognize truth diminished. And not only will this person receive less truth, they will eventually lose grasp of the truth that they once had. Think about it this way for a minute. Most of us, when we were in school, learned how to do things such as speak foreign languages play musical instruments. I know when I was in school, I, I took uh, three years of French in high school and a year and a half of it in college. Now that was 30 some odd years ago. If you asked me to give you a sentence in French right now, I'd be lost. I spent over 10 years learning how to play every single kind of saxophone. Again, some 35 years ago. If I picked up a saxophone, I wouldn't even know where to put my fingers. Why? Because I haven't practiced those things since I learned them. And since I haven't practiced them, I've lost the ability to do them like I used to be able to do. I took a whole lot of math classes in science, but, but my career doesn't require me to use a whole lot of math. Guess what? I didn't forget how to do that stuff. Try to help my sons with their, their, their studies, and I find myself having to look up more stuff than they do. Why? Because I haven't used algebra and geometry and calculus since God knows when. And it's the same way with this spiritual thing. Rejecting God's truth is far more serious than failing to stay brushed up on your math. Rejecting spiritual truth will develop into a tragedy in the life of every person who rejects the light. And Jesus makes it plain, their rejection of the truth will condemn them to hell. Understand something as we close this thing out. That little lamp, that little candle 
holds tremendous power. It has the ability to dispel darkness. You've gone into a room and you, you don't have to, 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 to turn on a real big light. You can just hit the button on your phone where it lights up. And where that phone is, darkness is not. You walk into a dark room in your house, you go to the wall and flip the switch. Darkness is not. Why? Because that light has the power to dispel darkness. And one thing about that candle, that oil lamp, as that candle gave away its precious light, its very life was consumed. Now, 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 now understand that. You light a candle. That candle gives light to all that are in the house, as Jesus said back over in Matthew chapter 5. But you also know with a candle, as that candle gives light and as that candle burns, eventually that candle is all consumed up. You don't light a candle and expect it to last forever. Eventually, that candle's going to go out. Now, in part, I want you to get this. That's what Jesus did for us. Jesus, while he was here on earth, gave his light to the point where he was killed on Calvary's cross. But understand something. Jesus wasn't just like an ordinary candle. See, Jesus was just like that Energizer Bunny that we used to see on the commercials. You know how it keeps going and going and going and going and going and going some more. While he was here on earth, Jesus was giving the light. He was the one doing the teaching. He was the one revealing God to man while he was here on earth. You know how it's done now. You know why I can keep going and going and going? Because of you and you and you and you and me and everybody else. We are to be the ones sharing the truth about Jesus and about God that he shared while he was here on earth. The light still shines, but it will only shine if we let it shine through us. Now, that doesn't mean his light gone out. It just simply means that folk will not be able to see it unless we allow it to shine in our lives. I, I brought to mind that song we learned back in Sunday school. Uh, uh, as we talked a few couple of weeks ago, this little light of mine, y'all remember that song we used to sing? I'm going to let it shine. That's how it works. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And the song went on to tell all of the different places where we went that the light was supposed to shine. And it's summed up by saying in that last verse, everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. That ought to be what your life looks like if you're a child of God. No matter where you are, whether you're at work, whether you're at school, whether you're, you're, you're in your neighborhood, whether you're at the groceries, I don't care where you are, your light ought to be shining. How did Jesus say it back in Matthew 5 that we looked at? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. When your light shines, when you're living in the light as you're supposed to do, men will see you 
and want to come to a knowledge of what's shining through you. They'll want to come to a knowledge of God. They'll want to know why you are like this. They'll want to know why you are so different than other folk. That's what sharing your light is all about. And if you haven't been sharing your light, if you haven't been living in the light as you're supposed to, now is the time for you to come back to the light. Now is the time for you to rededicate yourself to what Jesus has called you to do. And that's simply to share him with a lost and dying world. Now is your time to come in, in, in with a repentant spirit. He is faithful and he is just to forgive you and to restore you so that his light can shine through you once again. If you're not a child of God this morning, you need to understand what Jesus said about that light. He is the light of the world. He's the one who came to get rid of the darkness. He's the one who came to set you free from sin. He's the one who came to reconcile you back to God. And he did all of that through his death on the cross. His death, John tells us in 1 John chapter 2, it was a propitiation. It was a substitution. You know what that means? It should have been you hanging on that cross. It should have been you who died for you, the sins that you committed. Prophet Ezekiel tells us very plainly that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. But Jesus came to die in your place for your sins. He who knew no sin, so you wouldn't have to. Just sum it up this way. Jesus died for you. And if he was willing to die for you, shouldn't you right now be willing to live for him? You can do so, first of all, by believing what you just heard, by repenting of all of your sins, by confessing that Jesus is Christ and that he is God's son, and by being baptized in his blood for the remission of all of your sins, and living faithfully till you die one day heaven with all of its glory and seeing God's face in peace with all eternity will be yours. Is that your desire this morning? Won't you let it known by uh, uh, responding to the invitation and whether you're in the digital worship space or whether you're here, you can respond. If you're in the digital space, just reach out using the, the contact information that appears on your screen, the email address, the phone number, whichever. And whatever your need is, we will make sure that need is met. If you need prayer, we'll pray with you. If you need to be restored, we'll aid you on that restoration. If you need to be baptized into Christ, We'll make it happen this morning. If you'll just reach out to us, we'll reach out to you. Let it be known right now as we sing the song of invitation and turn the services back over to those who are going to carry them out further. May God bless you and keep you. Let us.
disciples and said take eat this is my body and he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying drink ye all of it but this is my blood of the new testament which is shared for many for the remission of sins but i say unto you 
I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for thy son's sacrifice on the cruel cross of Calvary. Father, we ask as we take these emblems, which represent your son's broken body and shed blood, that we may do so with clean hands and a pure heart. In Jesus Christ's name, we ask it all. Amen. Amen. It's at this time in our portion of our service where we have the opportunity to give back the many blessings that has been shown to us. And let us remember the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Right. And in giving back, we have many options here at the Northside Congregation, such as PayPal, Bank Pay, and Cash App. Thank you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the many blessings that thou hast bestowed upon us. Father, we ask that we use these gifts, that we will use them pleasing and acceptable to thee. In Jesus Christ's name, we ask it all. Amen. Amen.
We pray, Father, that we will continue to try, Father, to let your light shine through us as your saints. We ask, Father, no matter how rough times get and how things are unfolding this week, Father, we pray that we will cling to one another and, more importantly, cling to your word, Father, so that we can continue to shine no matter the weather and no matter the situation. We ask, Father, that you just strengthen us individually, Father, and as a group, as your church, Father, and as your elect. We ask, Father, that as we leave throughout these doors today, we take with us a heart full of just wonderful thoughts and understandings, Father, of how we can go out and win those that are not of your fold. And we pray, Father, we can do it with love, patience, and kindness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.